has given us nothing which is not designed to make us happy. Not many actors could claim to have played such wide-ranging and diverse roles as Christ, Casanova and Hitler. But they're just a few in a whole string of characters played with great distinction by one of this country's greatest actors, Frank Finley. His love affair with the theatre began over 40 years ago, right here at St Gregory's Roman Catholic Church at Farnworth near Bolton. Since then, acting, be it on the stage, in films or on television, has become a way of life that has made him a household name and won him great public and critical acclaim, as well as the CBE. Frank Finley's formed of years in Farnworth centred very much on St Gregory's Roman Catholic Church. He was at the church school, he did his first acting here, and he was married here. Well, this hall... Um meant everything to me. This hall and these surroundings, these buildings, a little infant school when I started um, school, boy of five, then the, the, the junior school and then the big school, then the boys club, then the men's club. And uh, I think when I was about six, uh, they, they organized some kind of a show in this hall. And I, I do believe I had a sou'wester hat and a Mac and we sang some little songs. The first 25 years of my life, my whole life, was uh, evolved around my, my school and my, my church. I was, I was baptized here and confirmed here, made my first communion here, and I was married here. Uh, my father was buried from, buried from here, and my granddad. We all grew up, we were very uh, closely involved with, with parish life, the small town life. It was very, very important to me. And I'm, and I'm grateful to people like Mr. Warrington and Mr. Murray for nurturing me an interest in the theatre. It all came, started from here. I may have, if I'd gone somewhere else, I could have started somewhere else, but I didn't. Here, here I lived. And it was, it's quite a jump from being, um, you know, a boy leaving school at 14 to becoming a national theatre player and what have you. There's something happened in between. I remember... In the infant school, we were asked what we'd like to be when we, <laughs> when we grow up. Um, and I remember saying I'd, I either wanted to be an electrical engineer, I don't think I knew what it meant, <laughs> or a priest. I said, I'd quite like to be a priest. Um, I don't know, I remember once leaving one of the classrooms and thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have a job in an office. <laughs> I remember I went back and practiced. There was nobody else in the classroom. I remember it vividly, pretending this was my office and that I was leaving. I must, I was in the, I can remember the, the, the classroom just over there. Uh, I remember going back and sitting at my desk and pretending, well, I'm putting my little pen away and that's the end of the day and then walking out. And I thought that was nice. I went back and did it again. <laughs> um, I never have worked in an office, actually. As a, as a boy and a cyclist and a delivery boy, I knew every single street in the town, every single street. I don't think I could find my way about now because there's been many places knocked down, the houses where I lived have been knocked down and all the motorways are crisscrossing here. But uh, we were very much, <coughs> just as my family, we were very much a community. All my, my aunts and uncles lived within five minutes um, away. Farnworth itself was Farnworth and, and was quite separate from Kersley. As you know, the, the 11 miles or so between Manchester and Bolton, which crosses through Farnworth, so you wouldn't know where one started and the other finished, but we did. We knew to a house which was in Farnworth and which was in Kersley. Well, I was desperate to stay at school. I really saw uh, my, the importance of, of staying at school and get a, getting a better education. I was desperate to go to secondary school. Uh, although we were poor, we always had many, many books in the house. My father bought books as well as going to the library three or four times a week. He was a great reader and, um, and bought me encyclopedias. I remember he bought me these, these, I've still got them. I've still got the books, the encyclopedias and Dicken, books by Dickens. And I love reading and, I, and he bought me a desk and I tried desperately. I sat for every, <laughs> every exam there was, but I just couldn't pass.
mm. to get through, get my 11, well, the equivalent of the 11 plus, I suppose. So I left school at 14. The, one of the first things I did was to go to, to night school to try to get on. And I even tried later to, to take my school certificate. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't manage that either. If Frank Finlay hadn't fallen in love with the theatre and set his sights on an acting career, he would almost certainly have been a butcher. His first job when he left school at the age of 14 was as a butcher's assistant in James Topping's shop. His memories of life behind the counter in those days are still vivid. The counter used to come all the way down here. and was a form there. That was the front door, but it was a solid door, I'm pretty sure, in those days. I remember the counter being a lot wider than that, and everything, everything had wooden tops, which I had to scrub. It was a very busy shop. I think there were about, there were three, three brothers who ran, the Topping brothers ran the, the shop. And I seem to remember there being about six or seven lads working here. It was extremely busy. And I started off as an apprentice butcher and errand boy. I know they sent me off on the first Friday. I was here with this big, this cycle, the big heavy basket of um, meat and uh, I got lost in the fog. So they sent Big Joe to look for me and he got lost as well. But those were the days of real fog. As apprentices, we, we had to do a lot of the mincing, and we cut great big trays full of food, and it would be but not this mincer, but quite similar to this, an, an enormous thing, and it had a back to it, and we it used to sit us on the back of this mincer, and we used to have a pummel similar to this, and used to shove all the meat down, and it used to all come out. You had different blades on here that you had to change, and I remember keeping that very clean was one of my jobs which was quite a tedious thing to do. This place would, would be absolutely cram-packed full of women. And they all had, that Wilson and Vince, they all had their little jokes and that. And, and Jimmy, who I remember vividly, um, his great thing was, was he, he was always coming to say, all lean, and all the women would say, all lean girls. And on one occasion, they all fell off the form, which used to go down there, collapse on the floor, and some of them were too fat to, to get up. So there was a great hilarity caused by that. I remember one boy, I don't think it was here, but it might, I seem to remember it being, there were some switches over there on that wall. And he, he had a long knife in his hand, <clears throat> put his hand up with, to switch off the lights with the knife in his hand. And the knife just swung down and cut the end of his nose. <laughs> it didn't cut it all off. He put it back and he had a little, a little blue mark around there for the rest of his life. One or two quite nasty accidents, but I was lucky. While you worked here, did you assume that this was going to be your life? That oh, maybe yes. one day you'd run the shop, oh, or did you have yes. your dreams? I took about it very seriously. It was a trade. It doesn't seem to be a trade these days. People just seem to drift into it. But in those days, it was a definite trade that you learned. You went to night school and you learned the job. There was an apprentice. You got apprentice money. And uh, I took it very seriously. And as my family being connected with with uh, butchering, I, I, I had visions of having a chain of shops. I even designed my shop front and took it very I tried to buy a butcher shop at one time but I it didn't happen perhaps. So your so your sole ambitions at that time were to have your own butcher a shop. A business in the of end. some kind, yes, in those days. But got um, uh, directed towards other channels later. <laughs> yeah, <well done>. <laughs> 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 oh, my wife, my sweet, precious flower of youth. How can I live without you? How can I? Calm yourself, my brother. If you loved her so much, why did you have her put to death? <laughs> because she was a vile, faithless whore. That's why. I got involved with a, a concert party. Uh, I can't, I think we were always having concerts and I think it was a St. Patrick's Night concert that I got up and told one or two Irish bulls and blunders, you know, here, here I am first at last, I was always behind before, putting the cart before the horse, they, they call them Irish bulls and blunders, told a few Irish jokes uh, and, it, and, and a couple of Irish poems and then the following year did it again and got slowly involved in concert party work and I joined the elite concert party. There were five of us, and uh, we used to go around and play Masonics and concert parties, things like that. And I also organized dances. I was an MC, would organize people's weddings and what have you. That's slowly got involved in all that. In fact, I very nearly went into variety. I, I was uh, doing a very big concert at Bolton 
at the town hall. This was a St. Patrick's night, and there was a man in the audience who's, who used to write, he was a schoolmaster, but he wrote jokes for Ken Platt and two young comedians called Eric Morecambe and Eddie Wise. Mm. And he was well in with the BBC radio, Variety Bandbox, I think it was, in Manchester, and got me an audition. And I went along to meet Barney Colan, I think it was, and on the bill, Eric and Ernie. I didn't meet them at the time. And uh, I had an interview, and he said, yes, well, come back in two weeks, and we'll put you on in front of an audience, see how you get on, and if they like you, we'll put you on the week after and on the broadcast. Uh, but in the meantime, I got a job in rep, went to Halifax rep. So I missed my days as a variety performer. So you could have been Frank Finley the comic rather I, than the actor? Yes. I, yes. Now tell me, in your own words, did you sat in on certain nights last Gareth's tide? Indulge, albeit I accept in all innocence, in frenzied, oh, oh, naked, oh, oh, and obscene, oh, oh, satanic orgies oh, oh, with your master known to you as the great Grumble Duke. Oh, what? Tyler's Grumble Duke. That in? You're not replying, he's not replying, my lord. Are we to assume this horse has something to hide? I do that or he can't talk. I like this for if black satin known in the hierarchy of evil as black satin the loquacious. Oh. Are you? Or are you not the servant of Satan? Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Was that a yea or a nay? It was a nay, my lord, but I don't believe a word of it. I'd always had secret ambitions to be a professional actor. Always, always, from first getting, you know, the smell of the beast bent or whatever it is. Uh, always, but I would never admit to it. The Farnworth Little Theatre. Its most famous son is Frank Finlay. He was an enthusiastic member of the company for some three or four years, and his wife Doreen was one of its founders. Together they played in many productions before Frank launched out from this amateur society into a professional career. Well, with the help of the theatre company here, we've dug up a, a couple of pictures featuring you from yes. uh, the past. Uh, I don't know whether featuring, you remember if not starring, much about yes. that one. It says on the back, Miranda. Miranda. Me. There's my wife played the lead in that, and I can't remember anything about the play except that I did have to carry her. And I think I'd taken over from somebody. And I don't know what my part was was at what I was doing. It was a bit stagey. Do you remember this one any better? That one I remember very well, Trespass, Emily Williams' play. And this was my last time at a performance before I turned pro and went uh, to Halifax. And my wife is in this too. That's Doreen sitting there on the right. It's a fine beard you've got there. Made it myself, yes. I was always very good at makeup. We use less and less makeup in the theatre now. You know, with the modern lighting, you very rarely don't always need it. Sometimes. I still use the old five and nine. But uh, yes, I was very good at making beers. I made that one myself. Just thinking through this tremendous career that you've had, you've played such a tremendous range of parts. How do you set about deciding if you're going to play a certain part or not? Or whether I want to do it Whether or you not. want to do it, yes. Um, that is difficult. Um, difficult to know because often the really good parts uh, are not, uh, you're not aware of how good they are until you're halfway through them. Um, sometimes it's economical, you feel I've just got to do a job and, and <laughs> you do the next one that comes along, if it's possible and if you can find some way of, of making it work. Uh, it's difficult to answer that question, really. Basically, you, it, it, it's just an instinct. So, we pass over the facts that we know, no functional causes, no history of anemia, and so on and so forth. But of course there is a cause for everything. For instance, I notice you keep putting your hand to your throat. No? Why do you do that? And why do you wear that velvet band around it? It's the fashion, Professor. And the buckle was given to me by Quincy. He must be happy when you wear it. Yes, he is. But since he's not here at the moment, you may take it off. Of course. Now, one last thing. Will you allow me the liberty of examining your teeth and throat? Of course. Good. Now. Good. Good. If 
it's historical, if it's like Captain Bly in Mutiny, you um, start to talk to people who've already played it, if they're alive, um, and you start to read up a little bit about the, the real person and the historical events, and try to tie up uh, the real events with the, the author, the player's author's event, um, writings. And, um, and then you just read it and read it and read it and just look for clues as to what's going to happen. A lot of it is, 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 um, is instinctive. Uh, and a lot of it comes once you're actually playing it. It's um, difficult to get a lot from the written page. You've got to learn it and start moving it around and playing with other people. Um, and then suddenly little things begin to dawn. And very often in performance when you're really, uh, when the spirit rises, things suddenly come to you. Came to me the other night, I was playing, just about to go on for blind, just suddenly, it's just something just, I suddenly thought of and it gave me a different attitude altogether. What was that? Can't tell you. Secret. Secret to Bly, you see. Secret to Bly, it's something that he would never discuss with anybody because it was secret to him. But I suddenly discovered it. I just suddenly thought, wouldn't it be marvellous if Bly had that secret that he didn't tell anybody, but he carried it with him on that voyage to Tahiti. I believe it is wrong to oblige the slave trade by ferrying cheap food. Well, there you have it, gentlemen. Acting Lieutenant Whoremaster Fletcher Christie knows better than God himself how to manage mankind. I know, sir. I am sworn to serve you. I'm serving you shall. Three men have deserted. You shall find them. We have before us 13,000 leagues of sea over which to convey a thousand plants and 44 souls. I beg you will excuse me, sir. There were men of your watch. You know where they are. You must count them dead, sir. All right, Boson, start him. This way, sir. Hands off me! Come on, start that bugger! Do I have your word, sir? They will not be punished. No, you do not. Will you obey me, Mr. Christian? How do you feel about going on stage and doing the same thing night after night after night and matinees to Yeah, well, it's my job as an actor to do that. It's something that I find I can do. And in a strange, perverted way, I, I enjoy the long run. Enjoy is not the word, but... Um, I, I find it worthwhile to do because I'm always this guy. I never play things exactly the same. I keep to the same script, obviously, but uh, I, I try to go on as that character and, and just to see what happens. If you get another good actor opposite, you know, you're bouncing around a bit. Uh, and you just live it for that particular time. It was Casanova in 1972 that changed your life quite a bit because... Um, it, Did it? Well, it took you from oh. being a well-known um, and a, an admired actor to being um, a household name because yes. you were on television and yes. doing um, this, this role that caught the uh, public's imagination. Yeah. Um, did you as a fairly private man, uh, I mean, how did you cope with the, the widespread recognition that immediately came then? Uh, quite easily. It didn't worry me at all. Um, but you're talking about how do you accept a part. And when I got those six episodes, mm -hmm. Dennis Potter's script, they were the most wonderful scripts, I think, that I'd, I'd ever read. Um, and I couldn't wait to get to the end. I, I, was, I was very anxious. I thought, it, it can't be as good as this all the way through, but they were. Uh, it, it was the most wonderful, wonderful script. And I could see immediately, it really came off the page. That happens sometimes with a play. You get a play and it, the characters actually come off the page and you can almost smell them. That happened with Casanova. Christina. Yes? I'm dying to come and give you a kiss. If you are, my dear friend, come and give me one. got a lot of publicity. It got the BBC a lot of viewers too and some complaints. There was a certain football team that complained bitterly to the BBC because that the night that the, the Casanova went out was their training night <laughs> and, uh, and they, the, um, the team just refused to go for training and they'd lost eight matches in a row. <laughs> 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 and there's a certain hospital up in, near Newcastle. We had a marvellous letter from from the matron and she said we were getting sick men out of their beds and walking to go and watch the television. All the roles you've discussed, you obviously enjoyed, got great satisfaction from. Yes. Have you made 
many mistakes in accepting roles. Oh, well, I think so. Well, there's some that you wouldn't yes. have done. Uh, very few that I wouldn't have done, because even you always learn. You always learn, and sometimes, to be honest, you have to, you know actors have got to earn a living. You've got you know um, pay for the roof, or the rent, or the school fees, or, or you've just got to earn a living. People don't realise that that you can you can. Um, turn down work for a while and then you, there comes a point when you've got to accept not the next thing that comes along but maybe the one after that I don't believe in pushing too far to one way or the other I like things to happen and present themselves and then I feel it's right if it's been sent to me then I feel that's right I don't like to go pushing for something too hard or too fast in case it's wrong. Oh, thank you. What do you know of an inquiry at Southampton October three years ago? Nothing. I didn't even know there was one. Neither did I. You said Lister was murdered. Why? What have they told you? Oh, you do the talking, Frank, not me. They really have got their hooks into you. What am I this week? A traitor? A threat to the directorate, a mad old man bent on revenge. Five minutes, that's all. I mean it. All right. Lister pulled the same stunt at Southampton as he did later in London. He accused people there of misusing the database. I believe he was making a screen to cover his own activities. Oh, for God's sake, Quitman, this is Frank Strange you're talking to. Lister was murdered because his cover was getting thin. Prager and Hathaway didn't look hard enough at Southampton. They moved him to London to contain him, but they didn't succeed. You were fired. Did you Frank? enjoy that one? Oh, marvellous to do. Christopher Marlin directing. Wonderful. Because on film, you see, people don't always realise. They'd say, well, that was a good play. It wasn't a play. It was, it was a film. Um, you get a, a play, you, go and you rehearse it for three weeks or two weeks, you go in the studio and shoot it over four days. It's not quite the same as going, taking a, a cameraman and a... Simon out and a crew and going on location for nine weeks. Um, it's a different cup of tea altogether. That's what the actors like to do. They don't like the studio players anymore. You hate television studios? Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't want to do any more studio plays. Um, I think they're a thing of the past, really. But um, I think for economic reasons, that people have to still use the studios, and they're marvellous for certain, you know, for interiors and that, but to do a whole play, I think it, it's a bit, um, considered a bit old-fashioned now. You were, of course, awarded the CBE. Yes. Was that a very proud moment for you? Oh, yes. Yes, I was very thrilled about that. Very thrilled. It's a nice thing to be able to go home and show it to the family. How did you know you were getting the CBE? How, how were you told? Um... I got a letter that was sent to the wrong address <laughs> uh, and um, it, um, I'd sold the house you see but they went to my old address and it was marked 10 Downing Street so the gentleman who bought my house knew that it was important and, and we met in London and he handed it over to me personally. I said well I've probably been invited to a dinner or something but at the back of my mind I thought hello I think there's, I think there's something here that uh, I might be pleased with. And my daughter was with, was with me, so we went to Fortnum and Mason's. We thought that was quite a fitting place to go and have a cup of tea and open the envelope. And uh, there it was, it said, um, the Prime Minister has it in mind to rec recommend you to Her Majesty that you should be awarded the CBE. If Her Majesty so accepts the suggestion, etc., etc., will you please fill in the enclosed form? <laughs> which I did, like lightning. And went to the palace? Um, not with a form, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the nearest post office to Downing Street and posted it. To me. I thought, but if I post it across the road, surely it won't get lost. And then later I went to the palace, yes, in February, the following February. And what did the Queen say to you when she gave you this award? She said, um, what are you involved in at the moment? But I was making a film called Space Vampires. <laughs> I wasn't too sure. I wanted to tell the Queen I was making a film called. It's been changed now, folks. It's now called Life Force. There is life after death. How do you know? There is a certain mental transference, telepathy, that occurs between the vampires and their victims. 
Where is she, Falada? Don't you know? Carlson knows. Where, Falada? She's in the cathedral. She's been there since she escaped. Rather a nice touch, don't you think? The crypt of kings and queens. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. I was in the palace waiting um, to be given my C CBE. I was chatting to they you put in different little um, sections of the palace, and the CBEs are there, and the OBEs are here, the MBEs. You're told exactly what to do, and um, and I was chatting to one distinguished gentleman, and I said, "Are you pleased?" He said, um, "Yes." He said, "I just wish my mother was alive." And I felt the same. In many articles that I've read about you, you've been described as a private person, a reserved person, a nervous person, a worried person. I picked out all those words. Uh, someone who doesn't really like great public um, recognition and people going forward and asking for their autographs. Is all that true? I mean, what is the real Frank Finley like? But I think I am still basically shy, but with, you know, yourself and your job, the more um, you have experience in meeting people, the easier you appear to be. Um, I'm still basically shy, but with the years and years of experience of meeting people, you, you find a way of coping. Maybe it's because one is shy that one is attracted to going on stage and getting rid of all your inhibitions on stage. Lots and lots of actors are really basically very reserved people in private life and they get, <laughs> they put on the moustache and their beard and their wig and they can do the lot. Do you know where you're going after this? Do no. you have any ambitions? Any thoughts just where to, you might Just do? to keep going, that's all, putting one foot in front of the other. No, no, I, I've said before, I don't try not to plan. Try not to plan. Just hope that the work keeps coming, the family is still happy and healthy and we're all together. Um, just keep going along the road. What, what, it, what was it somebody said about you can't plan too far ahead because you can choose the road to travel on, but you never know who you're going to meet along that road. That might alter your decision. So I have faith in certain things and certain people.